Okay, thank you everyone for your patience. Uh, we'll reconvene the meetings and we'll ask um, Dr. Groskopf to put up the revised vote language and slides. Dr. Groskopf, would you be willing to read through the proposed language? Um, yes, okay, a revised proposed language based on the suggestions. Um, ACIP recommends that adults aged 65 years and older preferentially receive one of the following higher dose or adjuvanted influenza vaccines. Quadrivalent high dose inactivated influenza vaccine, quadrivalent recombinant influenza vaccine, or quadrivalent adjuvanted inactivated influenza vaccine. No preference is expressed for any of these three vaccines, for any one of these three vaccines. Um, so this incorporated taking out the word should in the first line and replacing it with preferentially. Um, also the clause in the uh, second to last line over the other two was removed. That was another suggestion. Um, the second bullet is if none of these three vaccines is available at an opportunity for vaccine administration, then any other age appropriate influenza vaccine should be used. Um, this was the point, one of the points that was discussed quite a bit. Um, this could be moved to a later portion of that section in the document if it is wished to be, have it construed as more clinical guidance. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask if my members feel they're ready to make a motion. If there's any, um, if there's any further discussion that's needed, please raise your hand now. Dr. Daly. Yeah, so I'm in favor of, I mean, I think this is important and I'm in favor of the changes made. Um, I am a little bit either confused or concerned that we say preferentially these vaccines are recommended, but no preference is expressed because um, those could be interpreted as sort of contradicting. So I wonder whether, um, I'm not sure, I have a great suggestion. I wonder whether getting rid of no preference is expressed for any of these three vaccines uh, just to avoid that confusion. And we're just saying, I mean, it's, it's hard. It's a question of sort of preferentially as compared to what, but um, in the first case, it's preferentially compared to standard dose. And in the second case, it's preference one over the other. But um, with that as a mild caution, I, I do appreciate, I do like the, the recommended changes. Over. Thank you, Dr. Um, Thank you, Dr. Bailey. Um, I appreciate that. And I wonder, could we get rid of the last sentence, no preferences expressed, and instead say ACIP recommends that adults age 65 and older preferentially receive any one of the following. Thank you. I like the suggestion, Dr. Actually, um, I was, I was going to say exactly what Kathy said, that preferentially receive any one of the following doses and then take out that, that last sentence. Um, I just, and I'm fine uh, with this, um, with including the second part um, because the frontline health um, providers, um, vaccine providers are, um, I've heard from them, but I really think that we need to bring this up um, in an opportune time so that um, the, the, the clearer, so that we can take out the second part as well and put it into a clinical consideration. Thank you. Dr. Brooks? Yes, um, I do agree with what was stated. I also said that at first I thought preferential was not as strong, but when you look at it preferentially, I'm rereading this, I think it is a strong recommendation. So I'm in favor of the language here, but I'm also in favor of leaving the, um, the language that is uh, the last sentence in, because I think that Without that, this is this is you know I think it's just not quite as clear. Though theoretically, preferentially does allow it implies the second sentence, but I still think stating it is important. Thank you. Okay, thank you, and um, thank you for the um, real time changes. Actually, I was looking at the slide. I, I was like, I think it just changed right in front of my eyes. <laughs> um, Dr. Talbot, are you ready to make a? 
Um, Dr. Dr. Lee, apologies. This is Lisa Grosskopf. May I ask a question? Mm -hmm. um, so just, sure. just for clarity regarding the last sentence, and since there was some discussion about um, the issue of vaccine having already been ordered by providers for this year, um, it, it sounds like there's somewhat greater comfort with leaving that in at this point, but um, I just want to make sure that that is the case. And also, it's definitely something that could be removed, of course, when we, as you mentioned, since we do come back every year, um, every year uh, for new recommendations, um, we could remove it the following year. Um, we do have our, our guidance is constructed so that um, we don't have a separate clinical considerations document. What we do have um, in each section is the we try to put the guidance right up front, and then there's ancillary information and other guidance in the sections that follow. We also have a four-page summary of the recommendations where we can be a bit more clear about, um, about clinical considerations. So I just wanted to offer that and just make sure that I'm clear about what to do about that second bullet. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Tabla, do you want to make a comment? Yeah, I do. I'm really excited. So I first want to thank all of my ACIP colleagues for um, tightening up this language. I really do like the changes a lot. I like them so much that I would like to go ahead and make a motion if I'm allowed to. So uh, there's a motion on the table. Would anyone like to second? Dr. Palin? Yes, I would like to second that motion. Thank you. Thank you. So it's been moved and seconded that we adopt the recommendation language on the slide. And we will return to the vote after public comment later this afternoon. So I am delighted to say, oh, is there, is there an additional vote on the table, Dr. Groskoff? I just want to confirm before we move on. Would you like to read through this? Apologies. Um, the second vote is to affirm the updated MMWR recommendations and reports entitled Prevention and Control of Seasonal Influenza with Vaccines, Recommendation of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, United States, 2022-23 Influenza Season. Um, Dr. Sanchez? I just wanted to, um, you know, to um, state that I, um, you know, for the for that I'm in agreement and to for the vote on this. So, are you making a motion? Yes, I'm making a motion to vote. vote. Yes, I'm making a motion to uh, to to approve this language and this vote. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Um, and do I have a second? Oh, this is Sarah Long. I'll second that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sorry, Dr. Paling, we could not hear you. So um, Dr. Long seconds the motion on the table. Um, it's been moved and seconded that we adopt the recommendation language on this slide, and we'll return to this vote after public comment later this afternoon. Dr. Groskoff, anything else with, in relation to flu? Um, two points to address previous questions. Um, one with regard to safety monitoring, um, if a recommendation is put into place. I have checked with the Immunization Safety Office and um, about the routine safety monitoring that goes on that's done actually on a vaccine-specific basis, so information is actually already collected um, and summarized in VAERS in terms of the three vaccines um, of interest separately. Um, and specific adverse events of interest are routinely followed um, mm -hmm. for them. Um, and with regard to um, the question about percent of uh, persons 65 and older who are vaccinated in pharmacies, I was um, forwarded one report for 18 and older that indicated 39%, but I will try to dig up more information about the proportion for 65 and older. Thank you. Thank you so much for those updates. Okay. And with that, I think we can move on to our next session on pneumococcal vaccines. Uh, yeah, I want to thank Dr. Talbot, uh, Dr. Gruskoff, um, and Ms. Chung for all the presentations. Uh, we really appreciate all of the time and the discussion today. Uh, so moving from uh, one complex set of recommendations to another, <laughs> Dr. Kathy Paling, Chair of the Pneumococcal Vaccines Workgroup, I will provide an introduction and overview of today's session. Good afternoon for those on the east side of the country and um, good morning to those others. Um, I want um, presenting on behalf of the pneumococcal vaccine work group. Next slide, please. 
Okay, and so I want to thank the many people who have um, contributed to the vaccine um, work group. Um, my co-ACIP member, Dr. Sarah Long, ex officio officers, um, and many liaison representatives and consultants. In addition, I would like to say a special thank you to Dr. Mwako Kobayashi, who's been the CDC lead and outstanding in this work. Next one. Um, and um, also want to thank our CDC contributors who've um, devoted a lot of energy and um, efforts to getting us the data we need and the great and ETR consultants. Next slide, please. All right. So um, this is a reminder of where we are, serotypes contained in the current and new pneumococcal vaccines. You can see that we have the PCV13 and the 13 serotypes. Um, and when we add PCV15, um, you're adding 22F and 33F. And then we also show what is contained in the pneumococcal polysaccharide 23 vaccine. Next slide. Okay, so in the next couple slide, um, slides, we're going to review the PCV routine recommendation for children the PCV13 catch-up, the PCV13 and 23 recommendation for children 24 to 71 months of age with underlying medical conditions, and the uh, final component will be the PCV13 and or 23 for children 6 to 18 years of age with underlying yeah. medical conditions. Next slide, please. Okay, so the current pneumococcal vaccine recommendation. PCV13 is recommended as a four-dose series at um, 2, 4, 6, and 12 to 15 months. This is commonly referred to as the 3 plus 1 schedule. Um, for children that um, need to be caught up, or um, this applies um, to all healthy children through 59 months of age, and children with underlying conditions through 71 months of age. All right, next slide. So for um, PCV13 and PPSC23 are recommended for children 24 to 71 months of age with underlying medical conditions. The recommendation is to complete the PCV13 doses and then follow that with um, the polysaccharide vaccine at least eight weeks later. Children who are immunocompromised or with sickle cell disease or a splenia may re um, are recommended to receive a second dose of the polysaccharide vaccine five years after the first. Next slide, please. Here is a visual representation of the children, a vaccine recommendation for children 24 to 71 months of age with underlying conditions. As you can see, all the immunocompetent children with underlying conditions, um, as well as those with um, functional asplenia or anatomic asplenia and immunocompromised are recommended to receive the PCV13 as well as the polysaccharide vaccine. And it's the children with functional asplenia or um, immunocompromised that are recommended to receive a second polysaccharide vaccine five years later after the first. Next slide, please. Okay, now, um, pneumococcal conjugate 13 and or uh, polysaccharide vaccine is recommended for children 6 to 18 years of age with underlying medical conditions. Um, there's one dose of polysaccharide vaccine for children with chronic heart or lung disease or diabetes. And then for all the other children, it's one dose of, poly, um, of the conjugate vaccine if it's never been received before, followed by polysaccharide vaccine eight weeks or eight later for children with immunocompromising conditions, CSF leak, or cochlear implants. And those with immunocompromising conditions get a second dose of polysaccharide vaccine five or more years after the first. Next slide, please. Here is a visual rec. Uh, representation. So for children 6 to 18 years of age with underlying medical conditions, you see that CSF leaks 
ACE selenia and immunocompromised, if they're otherwise unvaccinated, would receive the conjugate vaccine and follow that with a polysaccharide. For heart disease, lung disease, and diabetes, if they're otherwise not vaccinated, they would just receive a 23-valent polysaccharide vaccine. Revaccination is recommended for those with functional ACE selenia or immunocompromised. Next slide, please. So the general principles of what we're going to present is to consider use of PCV15 as an option to PCV13 according to the currently recommended PCV13 dosing and schedules, and consider interchangeable use of PCV15 and 13. Um, we're making no changes to the polysaccharide vaccine recommendations. Next slide, please. Um, to give you a preview, um, the policy question proposed by the work group is, should PCV15 be routinely recommended for U.S. children less than two years of age as an option for pneumococcal conjugate vaccine according to the currently recommended dosing and schedules? And then the second post is, should PCV15 be recommended for U.S. children two to 18 years of age with underlying medical conditions as an option for pneumococcal conjugate vaccine according to the currently recommending doses and schedules. Next slide, please. So um, to, to provide a timeline of what's coming on, it is anticipated that a PCV20 would be licensed in um, 2023. And we've learned that PCV15 was just licensed. Next slide, please. Okay, so here is the timeline to remember. Um, back in February, we presented the pediatric pneumococcal disease and epidemiology, the phase two, three um, PCV15 studies in children, and the first part of the evidence to recommendation and grade. We also received a lot of questions about fever and potential for febrile seizures and spent a lot of time paying attention to that. So today we're going to be providing an update on PCV15 use in children, cost effectiveness analysis, updating the evidence to recommendation and prepared for a vote if that's acceptable. And um, then the work group is now going to return and address questions related to PCV15 and PCV20 use in adults. Next slide, please. So to, um, next we'll have Dr. Natalie um, Benenitis um, presenting the PCV15 uh, Pediatric Clinical Development Program update. We're going to see the economic analysis and public health impact of PCV15 use in children by Dr. Andrew Leidner. Um, there will be um, a summary of the work group interpretation of the evidence to recommendation by Dr. Moako Kobayashi, and then the proposed recommendation for PCV15 use in children. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Paling, for that overview. Um, we will move next to Dr. Natalie Benedis, uh, who will speak about the PCV15 Pediatric Clinical Development Program, uh, and she is representing Merck. Good afternoon. My name is Natalie Benedis, and I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician and a senior director at Merck Research Laboratories. On February 24th, I presented an overview of the phase three results of the V14 Pediatric Clinical Development Program. We would like to thank the ACIP for their close review of the V14 Pediatric Clinical Data and for the opportunity to meet again today. Next slide, please. The first portion of today's presentation will focus on safety in the phase three pediatric program, starting with a summary of the pediatric database and the safety profile in the integrated infant population followed by the analysis of temperatures greater than or equal to 104 degrees Fahrenheit after the toddler dose in the integrated infant population. In the second portion of today's talk, I will briefly review key results of the subgroup analysis requested by the US FDA. Next slide, please. Starting with the phase three safety data, next slide. 
The V14 pediatric clinical program was designed to target pediatric populations in which PCD vaccination is indicated and to generate a robust safety and immunogenicity profile for V14 in children. V14 is approved by the US FDA for the active immunization of individuals aged six weeks of age and older for the prevention of invasive disease caused by the 15 pneumococcal serotypes included in the vaccine. The US filing for licensure of V14 in children is supported by seven clinical trials in children, six weeks through 17 years of age, totaling approximately 7,200 participants of whom about 4,800 received V14. Of these, approximately 6,100 were healthy infants enrolled at six to 12 weeks of age, of whom approximately 4,300 received V14. Safety data from three phase three studies comprise of a total of approximately 4,500 healthy infants, including approximately 3,000 recipients of V14 were integrated for analysis based on similarities in study design and dosing schedule. This population is referred to as the ISS in this presentation and is considered to be the most robust data set upon which to assess the safety of VU14 in healthy infants who received a four-dose regimen in alignment with the ACIP recommended schedule. Next slide, please. This slide was previously presented to the ACIP and it shows the integrated safety summary in infants, otherwise known as the ISS population with approximately 3,000 in the V14 group and approximately 1,500 in the PCV13 group. The proportions of participants with adverse events, including injection site systemic and vaccine-related adverse events and serious adverse events, are generally comparable between the groups, as shown in the last panel. Notably, there were no discontinuations of study intervention due to adverse events. In both groups, the majority of adverse events are mild or moderate in intensity, as shown in the right panel, by the green portions of the histogram with a duration of three days or less. The conclusion of the integrated infant safety analysis is that v 4 safety profile is generally comparable to that of PCV13. Next slide, please. This slide is a pictorial representation of how temperatures are collected and evaluated in the pediatric program. Upon enrollment, parents are given a digital thermometer and an electronic vaccination report card, otherwise known as an EVRC. Parents are prompted by the EVRC to enter daily maximum body temperatures at approximately the same time each day, from day one through day seven post each vaccination, and days eight through 14 in February. The rectal method of temperature measurement was preferred per protocol. On day 15, the investigator reviewed temperature data with the parents and entered new adverse events into the database. For example, an unsolicited adverse event of pyrexia may be entered, or a diagnosis such as upper respiratory tract infection may be entered if additional signs or symptoms are present. Contemporaneously, the sponsor's clinical team reviewed temperature data and adverse events to ensure complete and accurate reporting to the fullest extent possible. Next slide, please. As previously presented, the distribution of solicited daily temperatures in the seven days post this vaccination is generally comparable between the intervention groups in the integrated infant analysis, with a majority being afebrile in the seven days post-vaccination. Of those with temperatures greater than 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, the majority are less than 101.3 in both groups, and the proportion of participants reporting temperatures greater than 104 degrees is low in both groups after each vaccination. We will now turn our attention to the daily temperatures following the toddler dose as broached on February 24th by the ACIP members. At the post-toddler dose time point to the far right of the slide, the sample size included is approximately 2,800 participants in the v 14 group, which is more than double the sample size included in the PCV13 group due to the randomization schemes utilized in the studies. Circled in yellow at the right lower right portion of the slide is a subset of participants who reported body temperatures of 104 degrees Fahrenheit and up, occurring in 19 participants in the v 14 group with a point estimate of 0.7% and three participants in the PCV13 group with a point estimate of 0.2%. We were asked to share additional information on this subset by the ACIP as members noted a numerical imbalance between the groups. The subsequent slides speak to this. Next slide, please. 
This slide summarizes the analysis of the aforementioned subset using several statistical methods, including weighted and unweighted approaches. Of note, Protocol 31, the large safety study, contributed the majority of participants to the integrated analysis, with approximately 2,400 participants randomized five to one to receive VOM4 or PCV13, respectively. Given that the randomization ratio in Protocol 31 differs from that of the other studies included in the integrated analysis using one-to-one one -one randomization, a weighted approach to pooling the data across studies reduces potential bias in estimates of the risk differences. With that being said, regardless of the statistical method used, the difference between the vaccination groups was small and not statistically significant, as can be appreciated by the p-values noted in the far right column. Next slide, please. Continuing now with the same subset of participants with maximum body temperatures greater than, 100, greater than or equal to 104 degrees Fahrenheit following dose four, but focusing only on the 19 recipients of VO14. In regard to adverse events following the toddler dose, there were no febrile convulsions, nor vaccine-related serious adverse events reported in these 19 participants. 13 out of the 19 had adverse events of pyrexia reported by the investigator, with the majority of these pyrexia events resolving within three days, and all but one were non-serious adverse events. The single serious adverse event of pyrexia was deemed non-vaccine related by the study investigator and occurred in a participant who presented with respiratory and gastrointestinal symptoms. 10 of the 19 participants reported a concurrent, concurrent adverse events that were suggestive of an underlying infectious process along with the reported temperatures greater than or equal to 104 degrees Fahrenheit. 15 out of the 19 participants reported these temperatures during the influenza season. Additionally, nine out of the 19 had onset after day four post-vaccination and as such are less likely to be related to PCD vaccination. Next slide, please. To summarize, in participants with maximum body temperatures greater than or equal to 104 degrees Fahrenheit after the toddler dose in the integrated analysis, the between group differences in incidents were small and not statistically significant based on both weighted and unweighted analyses. No vaccine related serious adverse events or a febrile of adverse events of febrile convulsion were reported during among the B14 recipients. Maximum body temperatures may have been confounded by underlying infection and concomitant vaccination. As for all Merck vaccines, post-marketing safety surveillance of VU14 via routine pharmacovigilance activities will be conducted to ensure the safety profile remains adequately characterized. Next slide, please. Transitioning now to the second portion of today's presentation, where I will briefly highlight key results of the subgroup analyses performed at the request of the FDA. Next slide, please. As background, there were two different pentavalent combination vaccines used in Protocol 27, the interchangeability study, and Protocol 29, the pivotal study. Pentacel was used at study sites located in US and Puerto Rico, and Pentavac was used at study sites located in Turkey and Thailand. Each of these vaccines is manufactured and marketed by Sanofi Pasteur and contains diphtheria, tetanus, a cellular pertussis, an activated polio, and hip polysaccharide conjugate antigens. Pentavac contains two components of pertussis antigen, and Pentacel contains five components. In each study, approximately 70% of participants in each vaccination group received Pentacel. In March of this year, the FDA requested additional analyses for Protocol 29 and Protocol 27 based on a subgroup of study participants who received Pentacel concomitantly with PCV, excluding those who received Pentavac. The conclusions of the subgroup evaluation limited to Pentacel recipients are largely unchanged from the original analysis, despite the reduced sample size by approximately 30% in both groups in both studies. Next slide, please. The ad hoc subgroup analyses are descriptive in nature and no formal statistical testing was performed as the studies were not powered for success with a smaller sample size. Nonetheless, 
summarized in the table to the right of the slide are the conclusions of the subgroup analyses utilizing the statistical criteria of the original analyses. All original criteria was, were met except for mumps. The 30% reduction of sample size led to a decrease in power for the MMR non-inferiority evaluation in the pentacell subgroup. However, response rates to mumps were high in the V14 group and comparable to PCV13. To summarize, the immunogenicity and safety of V14 relative to PCV13 and the ad hoc subgroup analysis limited to participants who receive Pentacel as a concomitant vaccine are consistent with the primary analysis in the overall population. Next slide, please. And to wrap up with the key conclusions of the V14 pediatric clinical program, next slide. In children with an unmet medical need for pneumococcal disease prevention, V14 is well tolerated with a safety profile that is consistent with licensed PCVs. V14 induces robust immune responses to the 13 shared serotypes with PCV13. V14 is superior to PCV13 for the shared serotype 3 and the unique serotypes 22F and 33L, which are of high public health importance. And V14 can be administered concomitantly with routine childhood vaccines. Therefore, V14 has the potential to significantly address the burden of remaining pneumococcal disease due to vaccine types and leading non-vaccine types in children. Next slide, please. This concludes the clinical presentation. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Benibis. Um, this presentation is now open for questions and discussion. Dr. Kimberlin. A uh, very, very quick, straightforward question. What day was uh, was the uh, PCV15 uh, approved by the Food and Drug Administration for use in children? I'm a little confused by some of the slides. Uh, hi, this is Darn Fink from the FDA. We, we approved the uh, efficacy supplement for use of PCV15 in uh, children six months through 17 years of age on Friday, June 17th. Uh, Ms. Bata? Thank you, Dr. Benitez. Um, just a quick question. When you were talking about um, the, the fever events and you, you talked about the seasonality, um, that 15 out of the 19 um, children that had um, fever, high fevers, um, was during that flu season, were any of them, was influenza confirmed in any of those cases? No, they were not. Thank you. Were there any other infections confirmed? <laughs> yes, other infections were confirmed. Would you be able to comment on whether they were other respiratory viral infections or something? Yes, RSV, human adenomavirus, and other um, respiratory viruses, as well as gastrointestinal viruses. Thank you. Dr. Daly? Um, yeah, thanks for the presentation. Could you go to slide five? Um, there were two listed serious adverse events in the PCV, at least I think that was it. Yeah, two two in the PCV15 um, group. Can you just describe which the, what those serious adverse events were? Thank you. Yes, thank you for the question. They were both serious adverse events of pyrexia. One of them occurred on uh, the same day as dose one. The maximum body temperature was 104 degree, 100.4, sorry, degree Fahrenheit. This participant was located in the United States and the concomitant vaccines that were received included Rhoda, Pentaxim, Hibric, and Hibrix. The reason for the admission for this particular child was due to significantly elevated hyperbilirubinemia, 107, and in the context along with the, high, with the fever of 100.4, there was a concern for gram-negative sepsis, and that was ruled out. The second case occurred on the same day as dose three. The maximum body temperature in that participant was 102.9 degree, degree Fahrenheit. This participant was located in Thailand. 
concomitant vaccines included DT, whole cell pertussis, Hib, Hep B, and OP, oral polio uh, vaccine. Um, this particular participant was admitted specifically because there was impressive tachycardia and there was a suspicion of bacterial sepsis that was ruled out as well. Thank you. Are there any additional questions for Dr. Benavides? I don't see any additional hands raised in this moment, so why don't we move on to Dr. Andrew Leitner. And I want to thank Dr. Benavides for uh, presenting the data. Uh, if there are additional questions, um, I'll assume um, that their team will be on the line for at least this period. Um, Dr. Andrew Leitner from CDC will present on the economic analysis and public health impact of PCV15 use. Hello, <clears throat> I'm Andrew Leitner from the Immunization Services Division of CDC NCIRD. I'll be presenting today on economic analysis and public health impact of PCV15 use among children in the U.S. I'd like to acknowledge the contents of this presentation were developed by two different modeling teams, the CDC model team and the Merck model team. This presentation will summarize the key findings from these two models. Next. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. Next. Here's some terminology and abbreviations that you can refer to if needed. Next. Previous studies have found that pneumococcal vaccination averts thousands of deaths and saves millions of dollars in direct medical costs. In particular, previous studies found PCV13 was cost saving when compared to PCV7. These two studies referenced with the superscript B and C were both presented to ACIP way, way back in 2009. Today's presentation will look at two newer models that examine the costs and benefits of including PCV15 as an option in the childhood immunization schedule. I'll be referring to these two models as the CDC model and the Merck model. Both models completed the CDC economic review following the procedures in the ACIP Health Economics Guidance document. Next. To quickly outline the rest of the presentation, first I'll discuss the study questions that motivated the two models, then the cost effectiveness results, followed by the prevented disease burden results, followed by a brief discussion. Next. The first bullet presents the broad research question motivating these two studies. What is the cost effectiveness and public health impact of including PCV15 as an option in the immunization schedule for children? This broader question can be broken down into two sub-questions about cost effectiveness and the prevented disease burden of using PCV15 as compared to PCV13. It's worth noting in their assessment, both models directly compared the use of PCV15 to the use of PCV13. When you do a direct comparison like these models have done, one practical implication is that the vaccinated individuals in a particular strategy in the model will all receive one type of vaccine. So in a PCV13 strategy, all vaccinated kids receive PCV13. And in a PCV15 strategy, all vaccinated kids receive PCV15. Then the costs and benefits from these two strategies are compared directly. I mention this issue because it will come up again later when we talk about some of the limitations of the prevented disease burden results. Next. Starting with the first research question about the cost effectiveness of PCV15, there are two key assumptions that go into both models. First key assumption is vaccine effectiveness. Both models assume PCV15 and PCV13 have the same vaccine effectiveness for PCV13 type disease. They also both assume that PCV15 offered additional disease protection for the two serotypes that are included in PCV15 but are not included in PCV13. These two assumptions taken together mean that in both models, the use of PCV15 prevents more episodes of pneumococcal disease than the use of PCV13. The second key assumption for the cost-effectiveness analysis is the cost of a dose of vaccine. 
In their base case, both models assumed that the average cost of PCV15 was less than the average cost of PCV13. There was a slight difference in these cost inputs across the two models. The CDC model base case assumed one dose of PCV15 was about $3 less than one dose of PCV13 on average, and the Merck model base case assumed on average one dose of PCV15 was about $1 less than a dose of PCV13. The next slide will show the results from the cost effectiveness analysis. Next. <laughs> Keeping in mind the two key assumptions from the previous slide, it should be no surprise that the base case results of both models were that PCV15 use was found to be cost saving when compared to PCV13 use. This result was consistent across a number of sensitivity analyses as well, including scenarios where the cost of a dose of PCV15 was increased. To be clear, in economic analyses like these, the term cost saving means that the total costs are reduced and that the total health comes are improved when the use of PCV15 was compared to the use of PCV13. And again, a cost saving result here is not surprising given that it was assumed PCV15 prevents more disease while costing about the same as PCV13. Another way to state that health outcomes are improved is to say that disease burden is prevented. The next couple of slides will focus on approximately how much additional disease burden might be prevented by the use of PCV15. I'll address the question of prevented disease burden by first discussing a few more assumptions in the two models. A few key model characteristics are listed in the first column the two models are identified in the column headings in the middle and on the right. The first row describes the overall population structure of each of the two models. The CDC model follows a single cohort that is zero years old, so they're newborns, at the start of the model and follows this cohort for 17 years. In contrast, the Merck model uses a multi-cohort approach, which means at the start of the model, there's not one single cohort of newborns, but there are 100 cohorts, one cohort for each year of age, zero to 100 years. Furthermore, in the Merck model, these 100 cohorts are followed for 100 years, with a new cohort being born and added to the population at each year in the model. Considering the differences described in these first two rows, the overall population size of the Merck model is considerably larger than the population represented in the CDC model. This model characteristic will go a long way toward explaining the differences between the base case results of the two models. While the Merck model has a much larger population in the base case, the Merck model also runs several scenarios where they use a single cohort very similar to the CDC model base case. These single cohort scenarios will be the main results used in our discussion on prevented disease burden. While the Merck model single cohort results and the CDC base case results are fairly comparable, they are not identical. Some of the remaining differences in the two models estimates of prevented disease burden can be attributable to differences in incidence assumptions which are briefly summarized in the bottom row here. On the next slide, we'll look at the prevented disease burden estimates from the two models side by side. Here are the main results from the two model estimates of prevented disease burden using PCV15 as compared to PCV13. The CDC base case is in the first row, the Merck base case is in the bottom row, and one of the Merck single cohort scenarios is in the middle row. The disease outcomes prevented are listed across the column headings, invasive disease, pneumonia, which combines inpatient and outpatient episodes, acute otitis media, deaths, and the final column is the quality adjusted life years gained. As discussed, the Merck base case in the bottom row represented a substantially larger population over much longer model duration, 
So those estimates are quite a bit larger than the results in the two top rows that used single cohorts. Uh, click. Looking at just the single cohort results, as I alluded to on the previous slide, much of the differences in IPD, NBP, AOM, and deaths can be explained by differences in inputs of incidents. Differences in qualities gained are due to both incidence inputs and health utility inputs. Next slide. On this slide, I took the estimates from the single cohort scenarios and used them to construct the range for each of the prevented disease outcomes. If one cohort of infants receives PCV15 instead of PCV13, then the range of disease burden prevented might be expected to look like the values in the table in the middle. A few considerations to keep in mind, this table is for one cohort that receives PCV15 instead of PCV13. If multiple cohorts were given PCV15 instead of PCV13, then the prevented disease burden would be greater. If adoption of PCV15 is lower, by which I mean there is actually a mixture of use between PCV15 and PCV13, then the prevented disease burden would be smaller. This point was alluded to early on when I described these models as using one vaccine or another for a given strategy in their direct comparisons. Finally, if indirect effects to older adults were included in these static cohort scenarios, then the prevented disease burden would be greater. A caveat to that would be that if vaccination coverage rates among U.S. adults for PCV15 and PCV20 is high, then any indirect effects from childhood use of PCV15 could be modest. Next. The first major conclusion from the two models is that PCV15 use appears to be cost-saving when compared to PCV13. PCV vaccines going back to PCV7 have been found generally to reduce direct medical costs and improve health outcomes. Two models in previous research have shown that PCV13 use was cost-saving when compared to PCV7. The two models we looked at today concluded that PCV15 use is cost-saving when compared to PCV13. In today's two models, the key assumptions that led to this result were vaccine effectiveness and vaccine cost. For vaccine effectiveness, I'd like to add that the work group discussed the uncertainty of these VE assumptions in light of these assumptions being based upon immunogenicity data. The other assumption was vaccine cost. Another interesting point about vaccine cost, in these assessments, PCV15 was less expensive or approximately the same as PCV13. In the older studies that compared PCV13 to PCV7, PCV13 was actually more expensive than PCV7 and was still found to be cost-saving when compared to the less expensive alternative. The second major conclusion is that pneumococcal vaccination of children has historically had a notable health impact, and that may be true for the use of PCV15 as well, since both models estimate that overall health is improved when PCV15 is used as compared to PCV13. This finding is certainly conditional on the assumption that both models used where the vaccine effectiveness of PCV15 was assumed to be equal to PCV13 for PCV13 type disease and was assumed to provide additional protection for those two additional serotypes. Differences in the estimated prevented disease burden appear to be due to differences in model structure and input values. With all these differences in consideration, the CDC model could be considered as more conservative than the Merck model. Next. With that, I would like to once again acknowledge the hard work of the two modeling teams that contributed content to this presentation. And I would like to also thank several colleagues at CDC who provided feedback on this presentation and who helped with reviewing the technical content of the models this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Leitner. Um, and this presentation is now open for questions. 
Dr. Larry. Thank you for this presentation. I thoroughly enjoy economic evaluations. I'm nerdy that way. I have a question and a comment. Um, the Merck 100-year cohort study, um, was anyone looking at the possibility that the PCV15 would be lasting beyond childhood and give additional benefits to adults? Uh, are you referring to indirect effects? Um, less indirect effects where you're protecting because it's less in the environment, but um, protecting against adult pneumonia and adult infections that might be showing up. Okay. So maybe if you call that indirect effects, then yeah. Okay. Um, so both models assume direct protection from the vaccine would wane to zero after approximately 15 years of, of some amount of direct protection. Both models also assumed there is an amount of indirect protection or indirect effects um, in the, it's, it's, it's quite complicated. In the Merck base case, um, indirect effects were allowed to protect uh, individuals in year one of the model who were um, at the older ages, 65 and up. Um, indirect effects were also allowed to provide protection to the younger cohorts for whom uh, their direct protection had waned to zero after the 15-year period. That said, the Merck model only assumed indirect effects would occur with respect to IPD and not NBP or otitis media. Um, to summarize the CDC model assumptions, in their single cohort base case, indirect effects did occur and did give benefit to individuals who were non-vaccinated in that cohort and for individuals for whom their direct protection had waned to zero over the 17-year uh, duration of the model. What the CDC model did not include is protection from vaccinating newborns that would then immediately transfer to 65-year-olds in year one of the model. Um, and the caveat, just to recap that, the caveat with assuming indirect effects would apply to uh, you know, year one 65-year-olds is that those individuals are already recommended to receive PCV 15 and 20, and um, if they're getting direct protection from the vaccines that they're recommended to receive, the indirect effects may be uh, not as, maybe more modest, I think is the term we used. Thank you. That did answer my question. I appreciate it. Thank you. Dr. Sanchez? Yes. Uh, thank you for that presentation. I, I just had a question um, that about vaccine cost because, and maybe you mentioned it specifically and I missed it. Um, one of your assumptions was that the average cost per PCV 15 is less than that of PCV 13. And that, so that is a known fact. I'm just surprised that any new vaccine is actually cheaper than any than an old one. Hi, um, this is Dr. Kobayashi. So this assumption was based on the current, so PCV15 is already licensed for use in adults. So there is um, a private um, market price available um, on the CDC website for PCV15. So when you compare that to that of PCV13, uh, PCV15 is actually priced lower. Um, and we also um, communicated with the Merck about you know, what the appropriate estimate for the vaccine cost will be. So. Um, we did do sensitivity analysis, or both models, I believe, you know, included sensitivity analysis, which provided some range to the estimated cost. But the basis was um, the current information available for PCV15 cost for adults. I'm sorry, you're breaking up some. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, should I repeat that, or was it part of it? That yes, 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 please. Okay, yeah. yes. So um, basically, the um, cost was assumption on the cost for PCV15, since PCV15 is already recommended for use for um, in adults, we do have 
the private market cost available on the CDC website. So if you compare that to the private market cost of PCB13, uh, PCB15 is actually priced lower. And we also, uh, in this process, you know, communicated with um, Merck to understand what would be an appropriate estimate of the cost of PCB15. So the estimates used in the models are based on that, and there were some sensitivity analysis um, providing some range to the estimated cost. I hope that helped answer the question. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional questions for Dr. Light? Okay, thank you, Dr. Leitner. We appreciate your presentation um, and always appreciate the uh, independent CDC analyses. Uh, next, we'll have Dr. Miwako Kobayashi, who will present a summary of the work group interpretation of the evidence to recommendations framework. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon. On behalf of the pneumococcal vaccines work group, I will present the updates to the evidence to recommendation framework for use of 15 valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccination in children. At the February ACIP meeting, we presented the work group interpretation on ETR domains public health problem, benefits and harms, values, and equity. After review of additional data and discussion after the February ACIP meeting, the work group updated the interpretation on ETR domains benefits and harms and equity. Today, I will provide a summary of the workgroup interpretation of each ETR domain, including domains acceptability, feasibility, and resource use that were not presented previously, as well as the rationale of the updated workgroup interpretation for domains, benefits, and harms, and equity. As a reminder, we have two PICO questions. The first question is, should PCV15 be recommended as an option for pneumococcal conjugate vaccination according to currently recommended dosing and schedules for U.S. children younger than two years of age? The second question is, should PCV15 be recommended as an option for pneumococcal conjugate vaccination according to currently recommended dosing and schedules for U.S. children aged 2 to 18 years of age with underlying medical conditions? Both policy questions compare PCV15 to PCV13 use. And the outcomes that were considered to be critical were vaccine type invasive pneumococcal disease, vaccine type pneumococcal pneumonia, vaccine type acute otitis media, deaths due to vaccine type pneumococcal disease, and serious vaccine related adverse events. The first domain is public health problem. In this presentation, invasive pneumococcal disease, or IPD, refers to an illness with pneumococcal detection in a normally sterile site, such as blood or in cerebral spinal fluid. Examples include pneumococcal meningitis, bacteremia, or bacteremic pneumonia. Examples of non-invasive disease include non-bacteremic pneumonia or acute otitis media, which has higher disease burden. In children, acute otitis media is one of the most common reasons for outpatient care and antibiotic prescribing. In 2018, the incidence of acute otitis media due to any cause in children aged under two years was approximately 75,000 for 100,000 person years. Pneumococcus is estimated to account for 24% of clinically diagnosed acute otitis media in children. The estimated incidence of all-cause pneumonia in children was approximately 1,300 to 4,000 per 100,000 person years in children aged under 17 years. Studies using administrative data have shown decline in incidence of acute otitis media and hospitalization due to all-cause and pneumococcal pneumonia in children post-PCV introduction. This graph shows the incidence rates of IPD among children aged under five years during 2007 to 2019 from CDC's active bacterial core surveillance data. After introduction of PCV13 for children in 2010, rates of PCV13 type IPD, shown here in orange, declined sharply. 
after 2013, declines in PCV13 type IPD rates plateaued at less than two cases per 100,000, and this trend has continued through 2019. Rates of non-PCV13 serotypes in black have remained relatively stable over this time period. This graph shows the invasive pneumococcal disease incidence by age in 2019. In children, pneumococcal disease burden decreases with increasing age. In children aged 5 to 17 years, around 25% of these cases had a medical condition that is an indication for PCV13. This table summarizes data from a longitudinal study of children aged 6 to 36 months living in Rochester, New York. Children who developed acute otitis media had nasopharyngeal swabs or middle ear fluid collected. Among children with acute otitis media with pneumococcal detection, the two additional serotypes included in PCV15 but not in PCV13 was identified in 6 to 8 percent of children. The proportion of vaccine serotypes among children aged under 5 and aged 5 to 18 years with invasive pneumococcal disease from CDC's active bacterial core surveillance is shown here in green. The proportion of IPD caused by the serotypes included in PCV13 is 21 to 34 percent, and the proportion due to two additional serotypes included in PCV15 but not in PCV13 was 16 to 17 percent. The work group determined that pneumococcal disease is of public health importance in children. This interpretation is unchanged from February. Next is benefits and harms. For the first question, how substantial are the desirable anticipated effects? The work group determined that the desirable anticipated effects from PCV15 use is moderate for both PICO questions, and this has not changed from the February ACIP meeting. In the next few slides, I will summarize the evidence that we reviewed in February. For evidence on routine PCV15 use in children aged under two years, we identified five randomized control trials, or RCTs. All five studies are compared to those who received PCV13. The first four studies highlighted here provided data on both immunogenicity and safety. These include V114027, which evaluated the product interchangeability with PCV13 and PCV15, and V114024, which evaluated catch-up schedules at different ages using PCV15. The fifth study, B114031, was an RCT focusing on safety and tolerability in healthy infants, stratified between full-term and preterm infants. Infants were given either PCV15 or PCV13 using the 3 plus 1 schedule, which is the PCV schedule currently used in the United States. The study was added to the four studies above for the assessment of evidence on safety, which I will talk about later. Here's a summary of the evidence for the four studies considered for the benefits of routine PCV15 use in children aged under two years. Immunogenicity from PCV15 use was non-inferior to PCV13 for all 13 shared serotypes post-dose 4. Post-dose 3, immunogenicity from PCV15 was non-inferior to PCV13 for 12 of 13 shared serotypes, with serotype 6A missing the non-inferiority criteria. PCV15 had statistically significantly higher immunogenicity for serotype 3 and for the two serotypes unique to PCV15, which are 22F and 33F. The certainty assessment for indirectness was downgraded to serious since the four studies are all immunogenicity studies and correlates of protection have not been established for some of the critical outcomes considered. The overall certainty of evidence is therefore too moderate. For evidence on PCV15 use in children with underlying medical conditions, we identified two RCTs. The first study, V114023, evaluated one dose of PCV15 in children with sickle cell disease. The second study, V114030, evaluated PCV15 in series with PPSV23 in children living with HIV. Both compared PCV15 use with, with PCV13 use. This table summarizes the evidence from the two studies. Non-inferiority assessments were not performed in these studies, so the findings are descriptive. 
post-PCV dose, PCV15, had higher immunogenicity compared with PCV13 for 6 to 7 of 13 shared seer types and the two unique seer types, 22F and 33F. In one study that assessed PCV15 or PCV15 use followed by PPSV23, the immunogenicity after PPSV23 in the group that received PCV15 was numerically higher compared with those who received PCV13 for three of 13 shared seer types, but not for unique seer types 22F and 33F. For the assessment of certainty of evidence, indirectness was downgraded to serious since the studies were immunogenicity studies and correlates of protection have not been established for some critical outcomes. Imprecision was downgraded due to small sample size. Therefore, the overall certainty of evidence was three low. For the second question, how substantial are the undesirable anticipated effects? The workgroup interpretation for the undesirable anticipated effects from routine PCV15 use in children aged under two years was changed from minimal to small after further workgroup discussions. Upon closer review of safety data, some workgroup members were concerned about the potential for higher reactogenicity in children who received PCV15 compared with children who received PCV13. The safety data were based on descriptive analysis, and the workgroup believes that uncertainties remain. In the frequency of rare adverse events, such as serious vaccine-related adverse events or fever, um, fever of 104 or higher, post-dose 4. This certainty was reflected in the upgrade, updated grade table. For assessment on safety of routine PCV15 use compared with PCV13 use in children aged under two years, we summarize findings from five randomized controlled trials. Five serious vaccine-related adverse events were reported in children who received PCV15 across five studies. We downgraded the certainty assessment for imprecision twice, first due to the small number of events of the outcome in both arms, and second due to a wide 95% confidence interval of the relative risk of events that could not exclude the potential for increased harm or benefit. As a result, the overall certainty of evidence on safety was changed from 2 moderate to 3 low. The undesirable anticipated effects of using PCV15 in children with underlying medical conditions was determined to be minimal, which remained unchanged. In the two studies that assessed PCV15 use among children with underlying medical conditions, no vaccine-related serious adverse events were reported. Regarding the certainty assessment, imprecision, which was downgraded twice to very serious, once due to no report of the outcome of interest, and again for very small sample sizes. Therefore, the overall certainty of evidence is three low. The workgroup interpretation on the balance between desirable effects relative to the undesirable effects were changed from favors intervention to favors both for both PICO questions. The changes were made after it was clarified that the comparison that is made here is to PCV13 use in children, not the balance between undesirable and desirable effects of PCV15 use. While PCV15 is expected to prevent more disease against two additional serotypes compared with PCV13, the workgroup believes that there is uncertainty of the added impact of PCV15 use for, compared with PCV13 use, given that there are currently no clinical efficacy data. Additionally, there are some uncertainties about the potentially higher reactogenicity from PCV15 use compared with children who received PCV13. The next domain is values and preferences. Data on values and preferences of PCV15 use in children were not identified. However, vaccination coverage for three or more doses of PCV13 by 24 months of age has been high, demonstrating that the target population probably feels that the desirable effects of PCV vaccination outweigh the undesirable effects. For the first question, does the target population feel that the desirable effects from vaccination are large relative to undesirable effects? The workgroup interpretation was split between probably yes and yes, mainly due to the uncertainties about the magnitude of added benefit of PCV15 use compared with PCV13 use. 
For the second question, is there important uncertainty about or var variability in how much people value the mean outcomes, the work group determined that there's probably not important uncertainty or variability. The next domain is acceptability. For this domain, we reviewed Merck's provider preferences survey related to multivalent pneumococcal conjugate vaccines, which was administered in November 2021. Responders included a sample of 600 healthcare providers that prescribe or administer 10 or more pneumococcal vaccines per month. The healthcare providers consisted of 530 physicians and 70 physician assistants or nurse practitioners. Here are the key findings from the survey. About 40% of healthcare providers believe that the risk of developing pneumococcal disease is higher than the risk of developing other vaccine preventable diseases such as measles, mumps, rubella, rotavirus, chickenpox, diphtheria, tetanus, or pertussis in children aged under 24 months. Most healthcare providers believe that pneumococcal vaccines are highly important for children aged under 24 months. Healthcare providers stated that the following clinical features were important in pneumococcal vaccine choice in children aged under 24 months. IPD indication, safety and side effects, greater immune response to certain disease-causing serotypes, overall immune response across vaccine serotypes. Therefore, the workgroup believes that recommending PCV15 as an option for pneumococcal conjugate vaccine vaccination according to currently recommended dosing and schedules for children is probably acceptable to key stakeholders. Next is resource use. As Dr. Leitner presented, assuming that PCV15 has similar effectiveness as PCV13 against PCV13 type disease, PCV15 protects against two additional serotypes, and assuming that PCV15 is less expensive than PCV13, both CDC and Merck models show that use of PCV15 in the childhood immunization schedule reduces direct medical costs and improves health compared with using PCV13. Regardless, the work group interpretation on routine PCV15 use in children aged under two years was split between probably yes and yes. This was due to uncertainties about the clinical efficacy of PCV15 as well as the actual vaccine price. Some work group members considered the possibility of low but increased healthcare utilization in the PCV15 recipients due to increased reactogenicity. For similar reasons, the work group interpretation on resource use was probably yes for PCV15 use in children aged 2 to 18 years with underlying medical conditions. Next is equity. The work group interpretation for this domain was updated. Certain groups have lower pneumococcal conjugate vaccine coverage than others. According to the 2020 National Immunization Survey data, PCV coverage of four or more doses by 24 months of age was lower among children who are uninsured, black non-Hispanic, living in a non-metropolitan statistical area, or living in the lowest federal poverty level. There are certain populations that have higher pneumococcal disease burden than others. For example, invasive pneumococcal disease rates among Native American children less than five years of age remain approximately fourfold higher than in children of all races. Alaskan native infants had a 1.6-fold higher rate of acute otitis media associated outpatient visits compared to all infants. Native American and Alaska native experienced cyclical outbreaks due to serotype 12F, which is not included in PCV13 or PCV15. In these figures, invasive pneumococcal disease incidence by ear is shown by serotype groups and by race for children aged under 5 years on the top, and for children aged 5 to 18 years at the bottom. The invasive pneumococcal disease incidence in black children is shown in red, and the incidence in white children is shown in blue. Please note the differences in the y-axis scale for the two age groups, indicating smaller invasive pneumococcal disease burden in children aged 5 to 18 years. Black children continue to have higher IPD rates compared to white children, shown on far left. The remaining disparity is mainly due to IPD caused by serotypes that are not included in PCD13. 
The figures shown on the far right show that IPD incidents due to the two additional serotypes included in PCV15, but not in PCV13. The difference in the incidence between black children and white children has been small. At the February ACIP meeting, we presented the work group's interpretation for this domain as probably increased equity, but after further discussion, the work group's interpretation was changed to probably no impact. While disparities in pneumococcal disease burden exist, the proportion due to the two additional serotypes due to PCV15 was considered to be small. Some work group members noted that a differential PCV15 and PCV15 uptake may potentially lead to differences in the burden of pneumococcal disease caused by the two additional serotypes. The last domain is feasibility. This shows the current PCV15 price for adults in the first row and the PCV13 price for children below that. PCV15 private sector price for adults is currently lower compared to that of PCV13 in children. However, the actual PCV15 price that will be used in children is currently unknown. Considering that PCV15 is likely to be priced similar to PCV13, and since PCV13 has achieved high coverage, the work group determined that recommending PCV15 as an option for pneumococcal conjugate vaccination according to currently recommended dosing and schedule for children is probably feasible to implement. Here's an updated summary of the work group's interpretation of the ETR domains for the two PICO questions. We updated the work group interpretation on the domain benefits and harms. The work group believes that there are small undesirable effects from PCV15 compared with PCV13 use, and the overall certainty of evidence on safety is low due to imprecision. Balancing the desirable and undesirable effects from PCV15 use compared with PCV13 use, the work group believes that both PCV15 and PCV13 use in children are favorable. The workgroup interpretation on equity was changed to probably no impact, given that existing disparities in pneumococcal disease burden caused by the two additional serotypes is probably small. For the new domains presented today, the workgroup believed that PCV15 use is probably acceptable, reasonable, or efficient allocation of resources and feasible compared with PCV13 use. In summary, the work group believes that the balance between desirable and undesirable consequences is closely balanced for both policy questions. Should PCV15 be recommended as an option for pneumococcal conjugate vaccination according to currently recommended dosing and schedules for U.S. children younger than two years and for U.S. children aged 2 to 18 years with underlying medical conditions when compared with PCV13 use. Here's the proposed policy statement for PCV15 use in children. PCV15 may be used as an option to PCV13 for children aged under 19 years according to currently recommended PCV13 dosing and schedules. In the next presentation, I will go over the proposed language for clinical considerations, but before moving on to the clinical considerations, I will pause here and I'd be happy to take any questions with Dr. Lee's permission. And I'd like to thank the many groups and individuals, including the Pneumococcal Vaccines Workgroup and CDC contributors and consultants for their contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kobayashi. The presentation is now open for questions. Dr. Lair. Thank you very much for your presentation. I want to make one comment more than a question on feasibility. My experience with these recommendations is that there is often a delay in when the recommendations are actually practically usable in a private practice. So specifically, when we have something like the hepatitis B recommendations and we're giving them to all the adults, it needs to be published in the MMWR, and then I still find that it takes six months or so before the insurance companies will actually start covering them. And so this is nothing to do with the pneumococcal per se, but just a general comment that the, our recommendations sometimes take months before they can actually be implemented in private offices. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Thank you, Dr. Lair. Thank you.
Ashley, um, one question for you. So the, the wording here on the ACP, ACIP policy statement is a bit more permissive. Um, and actually, there were many pieces of the presentation. I actually was swayed by the economic analysis uh, that uh, might suggest um, uh, a preference perhaps was discussed. Could you kind of go through that discussion with us and just remind me uh, what the uh, pros and cons are? Sure, absolutely. So um, I, I believe you're talking about whether or not we considered a, a, a preference or recommendation of PCV15 over PCV13. So um, we are not, um, the work group is not, uh, did not consider a preference or recommendation because of the uncertainties that, that exist. Um, you know, that is reflected in the uh, assessment of benefits and harms primarily. So uh, we currently have assumed when we did the economic analysis that uh, PCV15 may be priced lower. But again, you know, that is an assumption and we don't know what the actual vaccine price will be. Additionally, in terms of the um, incremental benefit, so uh, we are basing our assumption based on uh, available immunogenicity studies, and we currently don't have um, clinical efficacy data. So there are uncertainties about the potential incremental benefits. Um, and then uh, lastly, um, today, um, Dr. Benitez um, presented additional safety data, which was uh, very helpful, but um, there were still some concerns about a potentially um, higher reactogenicity or rather un uncertainties around um, some uh, rare adverse events. So all, all those things considered, uh, the work group believes that um, rather than a preferential recommendation, uh, recommending PCV15 as an option uh, might be more appropriate in this situation. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, um, I, may I ask a follow-up question to Dr. Leitner? <laughs> um, which is, and I might have missed this, so apologies if I did, but could you comment on whether there was probabilistic sensitivity analysis performed or other types of sensitivity analysis? Uh, you know, in, you know, just thinking about economic analyses and when you're in that cost saving quadrant, um, that is really helpful. And agree 100%. It depends on the um, the cost of the vaccine. So if it does not come out as planned, then this would be a different conversation. But you know, if it does uh, uh, stay with that same uh, model or that price, then I guess my question would be: How stable is that estimate, uh, and what proportion of uh, the analyses resulted uh, in that cost saving quadrant? Um, sure, happy to answer that question. So both models did do probabilistic sensitivity analysis. Um, I, I'll let you know if I'm misremembering because I'll check it as soon as I'm done answering. But um, if I recall, it's all of the simulations in the, uh, in the Merck model were in the cost saving quadrant. Um, and for the CDC model, um, I, I think I just saw a, a, like a confidence interval kind of measure where the, the 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 two and a half percent simulation was cost saving, and that was the um, kind of like most expensive simulation that we saw a result for. Um, so they did; they both did do PSA, and all of those PSA were in the cost saving quadrant. And I'm going to double check that and let you know if I misremember. Okay, thank you. I just want to clarify: you said two and a half percent of the CDC model was in the cost saving quadrant, right? Or Outside the cost saving In Inside cost saving. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Are there additional questions or comments uh, from our ACIP members or from our leaders? Okay, I don't see any additional hands raised. I think your presentation was extremely clear, Dr. Kobayashi. Uh, would you like to move on to the next set of slides for discussion? Yes, I'd be happy to do so. Thank you. Okay, so in this presentation, I will go over the clinical considerations for use of PCV15 in children. I will go over the proposed guidance for children who have not received either PCV13 or PCV15, children previously vaccinated with PCV13 or PCV15, 
PPSV23 use for children aged 2 to 18 years who are at increased risk of pneumococcal disease and recipients of hematopoietic stem cell transplant. The guidance will be based on the existing recommendations for PCV13 use. Changes to the current language are highlighted in yellow in the slides. First is the proposed clinical guidance for children who have not received PCV13 or PCV15. Either PCV13 or PCV15 is recommended as a four-dose series at ages 2, 4, 6, and 12 to 15 months. PCV13 and PCV15 can be used interchangeably. Otherwise, the recommended number of PCV doses and intervals will remain the same. So this is the, um, based on the current recommendation um, for children aged 2 to 6 months. So for infants aged 2 to 6 months, either PCV13 or PCV15 can be administered using the currently recommended PCV doses and intervals. Everything else remains the same. The same changes will be made for infants aged 7 to 11 months. For children 12 to 23 months. For children aged 24 months or older. And lastly, for children aged 6 to 18 years with an immunocompromising condition. Um, next, I will go over the proposed clinical guidance for children previously vaccinated with PCV13 or PCV15. This includes both children with incomplete and complete PCV vaccination. For children with incomplete PCV vaccination, either PCV13 or PCV15 can be used to complete the recommended vaccination series. The same changes will be made for children aged 24 months or older. For children aged 24, to, uh, 24 months to 71 months with underlying medical conditions, we propose changes to the current language to clarify confusion among providers on what an incomplete schedule of PCV doses means. The proposed changes are highlighted in yellow. So for the first um, sub-bullet uh, of um, any incomplete schedule of um, fewer than three doses, we put a footnote to provide more explanation. And then uh, the second sub-bullet, um, it used to be uh, any incomplete schedule of three doses, but then that was replaced by uh, to specify what exactly that means. We propose the current language for children who have received age-appropriate complete PCV13 schedule. A supplemental dose of PCV15 is not indicated for children who have received four doses of PCV13 or another age-appropriate complete PCV13 <coughs> schedule. We are not making any changes to the recommended PPSB23 indications or schedule. Here again, we are adding PCV15 as an option to PCV13 for the clinical guidance. The recommendations for PPSB23 revaccination for children with immunocompromising conditions will remain the same. As mentioned, we have not made any changes to the underlying medical conditions with PPSV23 indications, but as you may recall from Dr. Paling's slides, we have included children with sickle cell, uh, sickle cell disease or asplenia under children with immunocompromising conditions because children with these conditions are all recommended to receive PPSV23 revaccination. Next is on recipients of hematopoietic stem cell uh, transplant. The current pneumococcal vaccine recommendations do not specifically mention recommendations for children who are hematopoietic stem cell transplant recipients. However, the best practices guidance for ACIP currently states that recipients of hematopoietic stem cell transplants are recommended to receive three sequential doses of PCV followed by a dose of PPSV23 beginning three to six months after the transplant, 
So we will include a link to this guidance as part of the new clinical guidance. Thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. This presentation is now open for questions. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Yeah, thank you. And really, thank you. This is um, very comprehensive and important um, as we deal with this vaccine on a regular basis. But, you know, and it's more of a comment. It'll be interesting to see um, moving forward um, once is the what is the uptake of PCV uh, 15? Because intuitively, if we can protect for more serotypes, I think that that's something that we all want to do. And we're looking at a PCV 20 coming up um, in the second quarter of 2023, which will be um, another um, it'll be another issue. But um, I don't know. I just on the one hand, I understand it's kind of like the influenza vaccine where people and hospitals and healthcare um, organizations already have um, the PCV13 available, but it'll be interesting to see what will be the, the if there will be a change, especially if it's even cheaper than, than the PCV13. But um, I don't know, on one hand, I feel like um, the benefits of added serotypes would make me more, more inclined to give the PCV15, but I understand the lack keeping it um, that it could go either way but I'm kind of torn about this but thank you thank you dr. Sanchez dr. cotton just a quick question about one of the very last slides after stem cell transplant when it's recommended that they get three doses of TCV vaccine are there going to be further specifications as to which vaccine is recommended or will it just be PCB? Um, currently- I get a uh, lot of questions about this. I'm sorry, um, <laughs> sorry to interrupt. Um, this is Dr. Kobayashi. So currently uh, be, to be consistent with the rest of the recommendations, since uh, the current um, proposal is not to make a preferential recommendation, uh, we were planning to keep it as PCV and then either PCV 13 or PCV 15. Okay, I think it would be helpful to just to amend to say that, and obviously it's different for adults. But hopefully this is something that the CDC will be able to answer at some point, at least for adults at some point in the near future, because this community is really left without guidance in the era of PCV 20. Um, not to not to confuse adults with children, but so it would be good to provide clarity at least for the children. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that comment. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? Dr. Long. Yes, you see how quickly the the um, meeting goes, uh, Dr. Lee, when I'm on a work work group. I have had lots of, we have had lots and lots of time to consider all these issues and have had lots of clarity. And I think you all are, are I have brought up important things. Um, but some of the things that we don't know, as we hone in on the next serotypes, Although we can say this is such and such percentage of disease above the 13 or the 15, and we will say the 20, we get more, and especially as we have really decimated invasive pneumococcal disease under the age of two years, we are now talking about mainly disease in older children and more and more disease in older children in those who have some kind of underlying conditions. And we don't have the same degree of knowledge of clinical efficacy of the miracle of how good will these vaccines be for these serotypes that I kind of think as stragglers more than um, uh, things that are obviously uh, causing uh, invasive disease in children under two. 
So we we don't have clinical efficacy. We know that the antibody response to serotype 3 is higher with this vaccine than with 13. But we have talked with pneumococcal experts, and the very abundant capsule of serotype 3 in models may require even more antibody than this advantaged antibody response of 15 um, can provide. And then the other thing, we can only deal with the information that we are given. And with the information that we are giving, we just would say there is some oddness about the numbers of temperatures over 104 following this vaccine compared with 13. And all, and we do not believe there was the ability to ask any question that could be statistically answered because of the small number of people in the studies, not to mention their heterogeneity of nation and um, other things, um, but also um, because we, we just didn't have enough uh, events and enough people. So we think that that is, we think that that's a little odd. And why would there be more fever in the second week? Well, we assume that's fever related to MMR vaccine. But why would there be more MMR vaccine, fever, high fever in 15 versus 13? So it, it raises, I'm not trying to overstate this. It really is uncertainty. But it raises the possibility that there may be a little stunning. Maybe you don't respond as well to MMR as rapidly, and you have more fever from MMR. We just don't know. And we thought that what would the public think if we traded a very small increment of benefit for high fever, febrile seizures, and potentially more fever from MMR vaccine. So th those were the sorts of things that we thought about that said, this is without any clinical efficacy, although we certainly will approve vaccines without clinical efficacy from a bridge. The pneumococcal bridge is very shaky to begin with. And um, uh, for this one, um, we thought we should not think about a preferential when we have no clinical efficacy. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Long. Any additional questions? Dr. Paley and Dr. Kobayashi, actually, I, I do have one question. So I think it's the two slides before this one you have up. And I realize it's probably off topic, but I'm going to ask anyway, because I realize this work group has a set of complicated decisions um, ahead. But this, um, you know, it's so interesting to me that for kids who did not receive, I just want to make sure I'm stating this correctly. If you did not receive your vaccine, you somehow got to the age of six, um, we would only give PPSV23 and not any conjugate vaccine. I just want to make sure that is a correct statement. Hi. Um this is Dr. Kobayashi. Um, that is correct. So for uh, the way the current uh, recommendation is uh, written is that if you do have immunocompromising conditions or cerebral spinal fluid leak or cochlear implant and you have never received a pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, then uh, those children are recommended to receive a dose of a pneumococcal conjugate vaccine followed by PPSV23. But otherwise, you know, if you have chronic heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, and somehow they missed the opportunity to get a pneumococcal conjugate vaccine uh, before age six, then currently they are not recommended to receive a conjugate vaccine. Okay, thank you. Um, and there was a plea to get closer to the mic. So I'm just gonna follow up with the next question you know I'm gonna ask, which is, I recognize this group of children is probably small given our vaccination rates are generally pretty high. Um, However, and I recognize these recommendations were made a long while back, for simplicity, has the work group ever discussed whether or not we should just 
offer the ability to do PCV followed by PPSV23 for anyone with high-risk conditions, such as those with chronic lung disease, chronic heart disease, et cetera. Um, was there a reason to, like, is there evidence to say we shouldn't do that? Or is that something that might be considered in the future? Again, because the pneumococcal recommendations are probably the most complex, uh, aside from COVID right now, with the youngest kids to implement. So I'm just trying to think of ways to make it easier and also hold to the principles of what we're trying to achieve. Dr. Paley? Uh, Dr. Lee, um, first of all, I wanna say thank you for asking this question, because I think you um, raised a very important point um, since it would be recommended once you get to 19 years of age. Um, the work group was working very fast um, to review data. And so we did not spend as much time on these questions. Um, but as we're looking at this slide, your point is well taken. And to my knowledge, there is no data to say we shouldn't. And you're right, it would be more feasible and um, uh, if we included that, um, I will acknowledge there's been no conversation in the work group about it because of a limitation of time. And Dr. Kobayashi, do you want to add anything to what I just said? Yes, um, thank you for that um, comment, Dr. Paling. And then uh, the other thing is that we were uh, anticipating um, another conjugate vaccine in the near future. Uh, we were hoping to also try to minimize the confusion as much as possible by uh, making a lot of changes to the recommendation. So therefore the focus was to follow the current um, uh, recommendations on pneumococcal conjugate vaccine use and then um, add PCV15 as an option. Thank you so much. I, I just appreciate the consideration of that. <laughs> um, any additional questions, Dr. Daly? Um, yeah, just a quick comment that I'm I'm in favor of the approach recommended by the by the work group um, for you know this feels like a time to make an incremental change um, and by that I mean given the uncertainty that Dr. Long highlighted in some of the important considerations here um, so I'm I'm in support of um, what the work group's proposing over. Thank you, Dr. Daly. Any additional comments or questions? Thank you. Dr. Kobayashi, um, is there a proposed recommendation slide you can put up? Yes. Um, actually, that was in the at the end of the last presentation. Um, and we'll pull that up. Um, one moment, please. Thank you. While they're pulling that up, I'll just remind folks that we'll plan to take a look at that vote language ask for any um, suggestions, and then see if we can move forward with a motion, but not a vote until after public comment. Thank you, Dr. Kobayashi. Did you wanna go ahead and um, yes. read this? Yes, uh, PCB 15 may be used as an option to PCB 13 for children aged under 19 years according to currently recommended PCB13 dosing and schedules. Thank you. Any further discussion or comments? I don't see any hands raised. Um, would any of our voting members like to make a motion on this language? Dr. Alt. I move that we accept this language as a motion. Thank you. We have a motion on the table. Would anyone like to second the motion? Thank you, Dr. Brooks. Uh, I second the motion made by Dr. Hall. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the recommendation language on the slide and also just acknowledging all of the many slides before that added that language into the current recommendations. Um, so we will return to this vote after public comment later this afternoon. Um, and with that, I would like to thank our presenters. And um, if it's okay with everyone, I would like to give folks a short break um, 
So if we could plan to meet at 30 minutes after the hour, so about eight minutes from now. Thanks, everyone.